American Timelines is a member of the Queen City Podcast Network. Find out more at queencitypodcastnetwork.com. So now I'm obsessed with time. Come on, tell me about the time. Had it all in my head tonight. Had the time of my life. When the words all come down, like blues on Tuesdays come down. Throw it all away. Throw it all away. July 13th. Yes. Of 1994. What was going on July 13th? Oh, so we talked about Jeff Gillooly. Yes. Um, he was sentenced to two years on, on, on July, July 13th. 13th. Okay. And O.J. Simpson was charged with murder, and he gave hair samples for testing on July 13th. Okay. Bill Clinton was the president. Angels in the Outfield was the number one movie. Also, mm-hmm. The Client with Susan Sarandon and Tommy Lee. Mm-hmm. I didn't see that. All for One was the number one song. I yeah. swear. Oh, God. Hit the moon no more. in this. No Warren more. G. Regulate. Riders, mount up. Or oh. something, mount up. Regulators, know. mount up. That's right. Oh, yeah. I Janet can't. Jackson, anytime, mm-hmm. in any place, I don't care. Lisa Loeb and Nine Stories. Remember mm-hmm. that? Stay. Oh, yes. Because I missed you. Ugh. Those glasses. Mm-hmm. Ace of Bass. Don't turn around. Uh-huh. Never gonna see my happy man. <laughs> Is that what I say? Uh, um, yeah, I guess. And on television this night, on, on TV this night, July 13th was a Wednesday. Mm-hmm. CBS was The Nanny. Yeah. Uh, and after The Nanny was a show called Good Advice, which I researched this night, had no idea. Yeah. Do you remember this show? No. Shelley Long, Treat Williams, and Terry Garr. No. It was only on for two seasons. Um, Shelley Long was a- You remember this? No, not at oh, all. Okay. That's why I had to research. I was like, what is this? Shelley Long was a successful marriage therapist and the author of a best-selling book on the subject. Upon returning from a six-week promotional tour, she discovers her husband of 11 years, Joey, played by Christopher McDonald, in bed with another man. (laughs) Furthermore, when she returns to her therapy office, she learns she is now sharing it with high-profile divorce attorney Jack Harold Treat Williams. Oh, love is in the air. Yeah, while Susan and Jack don't agree on the basics of relationships, Love or marriage, the one thing they do share is an undeniable sexual chemistry. They were trying to recreate Sam and Diane, and it was not a success. No. On ABC that night was The Dinosaurs, The Critic, Home Improvement, and Grace Under Fire. With Rhett Butler, remember her? Mm-hmm. Fox had 90210 and the Models, Inc. Happened. Um, so just after 2 a.m. on July 13th, yeah, police were called to a crime scene that... Um, it was a triple murder. July 13th, so the morning of July 13th. Yeah, at 2 a.m. So um, it was a crime. Before that, all those shows were on. Mm-hmm. Okay. It was a crime that would take them 10 years to bring to Police justice. Police were called where? Bellevue, Washington. Bellevue, Washington. Yes. Um, it was the Raffay family. and. Did you spell that? R-A-F-A-Y, Raffay. Raffay. Raffay family. So Triple murder. Yes, so huh. I got a lot of this information from the 48 Hours website. <laughs> okay, Maybe. so um, the story begins July 13th, 1994, with a call for help. Sebastian Burns and his friend, Atif Rafay, had, some, had stumbled in, onto a horrific crime scene. Atif's parents had been found murdered. Atif Rafay? R- Rafay. R A F A Y. Atif is the Atif first Rafay. Okay. Yes, his parents had been found murdered. In, in and July. he's with his friend Sebastian. Okay. Um, so Sultana Rafay, Atif's mother, had been the first to be killed. And um, Sebastian tells them he see, he saw her lying on the floor. So he comes home. From they come somewhere? home. They both come home from the movies at two in the morning. Yeah. Hmm. Um, Already suspicious. And Atif's father, Tariq Rafay, was the next to be murdered, and he Wait, was. Is it two boys that come home? Yeah. That they're both boys. That yeah. Come home and they're discover this murder yeah. scene. Um, the and the father was had been up in the bedroom, and he had been bludgeoned like thirty to forty times. Uh, like it was overkill. It was yeah. So that's a he was face that, was now, just his I'm, head I'm was picking just this mush. up because you're making me watch this stuff. That makes you think it's a crime of passion. Yeah, somebody be. that knows him. Yeah, strangers okay. don't bash somebody over the head th- over thirty times, right? Yeah, yeah. That's what I'm putting together. Or here. it's a or it could be. I mean, we'll get to this. I mean, it could be. There's other things too. That okay, there's be. other things that are coming up, but. But that's not out of the ordinary for me to think right. that. It's not. So you're saying I'm a great detective. So um, 
As the boys waited for help to arrive, a third victim, oh, Atif's... Wait, how old are these boys? Do we know? They're 19, I think. They're 19-year-old yeah. boys, so they're so, like after high school, but... Yeah, before college. college yeah. Um, Atif's, Atif's sister, he had an s- older sister with autism. Oh, and um, How old is she, she was still alive, and she was moaning in the bedroom. Oh, no. And she's at the house. She's at the house, but they didn't check on her. Like, they they went in, and they found the place. They found the mom and dad. They found the mom and the, the dad. And the place was, like, trashed. Sort of, yeah. Sort of, yeah. And, um, sort of, yeah. I'll, I'll get to it. Oh. And But the sister was in the... They could tell she was alive, and she's, like, moaning in the bedroom. But, but she they, was injured. They didn't go check on her they just called 911 and then they went outside and waited because they called they saw the parents dead yes called 911 went outside heard the sister yes but continue to just go outside go outside and wait for the police but not not talk to her or anything right because she had autism i don't know she she died at the hospital a few hours after the attack um something ain't right and the police chief said it would make sense that she was murdered last because everybody knew she couldn't make a 911 call so she had, she was pretty severe. Yes. Autism. Yeah. So the Rafays had just moved to Bellevue from Vancouver, Canada. The mom had a doctorate in nutrition, and she, but she was she a stay-at-home mom. Okay. And Tariq Rafay was a structural engineer who had worked on buildings around the world. Oh, so they had money. Mm-hmm. So they couldn't figure out who would take the lives of this quiet family and spare the life of their only son. Um, so the detectives started to look more closely at the crime scene. Yeah, it, uh, I already think it's the son. Well, in the 911 call, Sebastian, who's the friend, right, said there was a break-in when he reported so what had happened. So he's the one who called? Yes. He, and he had said there was a break-in. He said, just looking at that room, the detectives said, just looking at that room, you start realizing it looks like someone set it up. Set Boxes up. were tipped over and drawers were open, but nothing appeared to have been gone through. So it I looked like it was a because it's a staged. Song. We know it. Because you're not going to not check on your sister whether she has autism or not. I mean, right, right. That's I mean, a weird thing. Yeah, unless you're a horrible person. So then that night, when police asked what was missing, Atif said two things: the disc, his Walkman, and a VCR. And so he says the only things missing are his Walkman, which and, was twenty nine dollars. Yeah. We and heard a last VCR. episode, and a VCR. Which were expensive in the 80s, but by 94, they weren't that expensive anymore. Right, and the detective thought someone murdered three people and took his Walkman and VCR. That doesn't make any sense. You're not going to break into a rich person's house and take a Walkman and a VCR. Yeah. VCRs were more, I mean, obviously now they're not worth anything, but then yeah. they were maybe 150 bucks or something. But, but still. not. So detectives um, looked into who these two boys were. Sebastian and Atif had been best friends since high school. Okay. They, they became very good friends because they were both really um, intelligent, precocious. The um, murderers. They were smart asses. They were they were both smart asses. Smart asses. Um, Sebastian was raised in a loving family with English roots and grew up playing classical cello. He was very smart, That's and intellectual. The That's the friend. Yeah. I've you know I've to this day I've never trusted anybody who plays the cello. I used to play the cello. Oh shit. Yep. That's the um, that's the. We're getting to the root of yeah. our marriage problems. Sebastian became a member <laughs> of the kidding, Royal Canadian Air problems. Cadets and was given an award by Prince Albert. No, Prince Edward. And Atif attended Cornell University. Prince Albert? Did you say Prince no, Albert Prince Edward. I did. I, like <laughs> I did say, Prince say Albert. that at first. You know what a Prince Albert is? <laughs> I do know what that is, yes. It was the summer of their freshman year of college when their lives took this unexpected turn. So, so they were freshmen in college. Police took the two to the station where they were examined for traces of blood and, and they found nothing. No blood on them. No, nothing. They were separated yes. and questioned separately. You know. Yes. That. And um, when asked where they had been that evening, they provided a full account. At eight thirty, they drove to a restaurant to, a bite to eat. Friendly's restaurant, probably. They uh, then they went to nine fifty showing of the Lion King, and then after the movie, they stopped for a bite to eat and oh, left the did. waitress a six dollar tip on a nine dollar tab. You know, it checks out that the Lion King was out then. So right. Well, but and why they, would you give a six dollar tip on a nine dollar tab? Well, it's like the what the police started. What what do you get for nine dollars? Police said that everywhere they went, the people who had contact with them remembered them. They were, um, they were. So they hired somebody. They were making it very obvious that they were, um, Wanting that they were at these places. Yeah, right. Yes, like leaving a giant tip, and then they complained about something at the movies and all of this stuff. Uh, so, so, but they something were covering else. Covering up their trail while they were murdering. 
um, something else, the, tr the troubled police, were how could Sebastian and Atif provide so much detail about where they had been that evening but not recall key moments at the murder scene? Um, then they also, then they got even more suspicious when the two boys were spotted at a local video store renting movies the night after the murder. So they put them up in a hotel, yeah. and they went out and they rented movies. Yeah, so, and, so you're in a hotel because your family has just been killed. And, you rent a and you're going to, like... You're going to, well, go watch. Uh, I mean, maybe there was nothing else to do. I don't know. But but, but you think about it, back then when you had to rent a movie, you're not yeah. going to a red box. No, I know. You're, you're going, going to, to a, a video store. Yeah. Gaspari's Pizza Video. That's right. And you're getting pizza and you're getting a video. And no, it just doesn't check out. Doesn't check out. So the police pressed the boys further. They wanted to know why Atif didn't help his dying sister, even though he heard her through the bedroom door. Yeah, that's my big thing. Is he didn't even check on her? That's bullshit right there. I don't care who you are. Three days after the murders, relatives of the Rafays gathered in Bellevue to bury the victims. But the only surviving member of the immediate family, Atif, was nowhere to be found. He was on a bus headed across the border to Canada with his best friend, Sebastian. Boom. So, now you know they did it. So they go, and Atif claimed that nobody told him his parents were going to be buried. And nobody told him about the funeral. But there's a Muslim rule that you have to be buried, like, I think it's three days after a funeral. But um, maybe maybe Atif didn't think it would happen since it was a murder or something. But um, He did it. So in Vancouver, the boys... Joe Spleen did it. In Vancouver, the boys were out of reach of the Bellevue detectives and an investigation that targeted them for the murder of the Rafay family. Their sudden bus trip across the border only raised more suspicion, even though they were both Canadian citizens. Um, huh. So... The detective thinks that they're guilty, but, Never he, trust but, he, the de but he just doesn't have enough evidence. Um, they went in, they searched the house, they found no forced entry. Uh, there was, of course not. There was, they did a luminal test, which is the stuff that shows up blood. They did a luminal test. Like blood that's been cleaned up, yes. you mean? Yeah. yeah, and they showed an enormous amount of blood on the shower walls. That so was cleaned up? The, yeah, so the, killer had, so the killer had used the shower before leaving. Uh, it was traces of blood. Uh, so it was a killer that used the he shower. He killed his family, man. So We know he did it. it they, they thought, is that why the boys didn't have a trace of blood in their hair, or their hands, or anywhere on their they body? They showered together. So they didn't have any physical evidence against the boys, but the detectives started to build a case um, they, based on their odd behavior following the murders. They cooperated. They did everything that was asked of them, but... They had this air and this attitude about it. Like, yeah. they're real snotty, and they're real unlikable. Yeah. I don't know if that makes them murderers, but they're, it's real hard to, to like well, them. I go through life assuming everyone who I meet that's unlikable is a murderer. Yeah. Well, they honed in on their demeanor at the crime scene and questioned why they sat in front of the house if they believed an intruder might still be there because they, they... Yeah, it's all... They didn't... Yeah, you don't check on the sister. You just let her die or whatever. You don't even look at her. And, and then you yeah. wait in front of the house. And police also couldn't make sense of why Atif would notice that his discman and his VCR were missing in throughout the whole house, that he just knew that those two things weren't there. Yeah, if he, didn't, yeah, if he just came back from the movies. Um, yeah. So... Um, on the advice of a lawyer, the boys decided to stop cooperating with Bellevue authorities. So they start digging, and they and they found some other stuff that was kind of dumb. Like they had been in a, Sebastian had been in a high school play called Rope. Oh, uh, that's a terrible play about two kids that commit the perfect murder. Oh, that gives them the idea. That's what the police thought. I think that's a little bit of a stretch. Uh, I mean, I think well, of all the plays we've been in and stuff. Like, well, I've actually done every single thing. That was in the plot um, of every play that I've ever been in. So, so um, cops are good. As the investigation continued, the boys they bought they bought BMWs for their, themselves. Oh well, shit! And they rented an Make apartment. Make it more obvious, a holes. And, like was the money from Atif's parents' estate is what they of used. Of course, yeah. Uh, what does this famous thing have a name? Does this have a name? This murder? Mm. They all have kitchen. No, name? it's like yeah, it's, Franklin Park Three. No, they didn't know. It doesn't. Um, it sucks. So Maybe they, we can name they start it living down. at an apartment with another high school friend named Jimmy Miyoshi. Oh, God, I hate Jimmy Miyoshi, man. That dude is nothing but trouble. So They move in with Jimmy Miyoshi. They, they hid from the media. They, They're the media still in Canada? Was, yeah, and the media is constantly pursuing them in the story. I thought everyone in Canada but was cool. then the RCMP, the old Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Oh, it's like the Mountie. Remember I told yes. you about the wrestler that started yes. Slaughter fought that was Canadian? Well, they decided to get in into the mix 
on, on April 10th, 1995, the investigators intercepted a phone message that confirmed that a salon appointment with Sebastian. Sebastian's going to go get his hair cut. But April they, 10th of 95. So they were both, they were Canada's most famous teenage murder suspects, but they wanted to make a, a screenplay about best friends accused of murdering a family, and they thought accused, they were Accused, but we're going to get off? Yeah. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police had this m tactic that they would use uh, to get confessions from people. Like called, the Mountie. They called it the Mr. Big tactic. As, as Sebastian left the salon, a stranger approached him asking for a ride to his hotel. The stranger then took Sebastian to a bar and bought him a drink for his trouble. He gave him like 100 bucks or something to, to, to drive him to his hotel. Um, and then Sebastian told the stranger that he and his buddies had written a screenplay. And Sebastian said he didn't have a job and needed financing. And then the stranger said he knew someone who could help. The goal was to get Sebastian to meet with the next guy up the chain. So this is all a, like a sting operation. Right. So like Sebastian it. thought he was about to meet a connected businessman, but he actually met with this undercover sergeant. The RCMP, which spent months preparing to manipulate their target, posed as professional mobsters and set up their first meeting with Sebastian in a strip club. So he's meeting with mobsters thinking they're going to fund his movie? It's all a setup. The guy that met him was a, really an undercover cop, and then they introduced him to the next guy up the chain. And... Um, Sebastian, um, so the crime boss told Sebastian he had cash to invest in his screenplay, but Sebastian would have to earn it. And Sebastian had no idea, however, that he was being offered work in a make-believe world of crime. So jobs were also promised to Atif and Miyoshi, and it would be things like running, you know, laundering money or um, just these, uh, these like, and they fake crimes. Real and they thought they it thought was, it was real, real crimes. Mobsters. They thought these were real mobsters and these were real crimes, and they were what? getting paid. So Sebastian's first assignment was to transport a stolen car from the cri for the crime boss for $200. Then Sebastian and Jimmy Miyoshi went from one bank to another laundering money. And then for that day's work, they were paid $2,000. So months go by, and the undercover operators took Sebastian to all these posh hotels, trying to build his trust and draw him out. Yeah. And they slowly start bringing up the topic of the investigation of in Bellevue and they try to draw Sebastian out by telling him he already knew what happened so he's got the big crime boss and he's like you know we need to build trust between the two of us and right. we need to right. know what really happened but we'd the already do know tell it, yeah and um, Holy shit. Sebastian what? doesn't admit to guilt but confides in the mobsters that if the police did find something to tie him to the crime he might want that to to be destroyed and so Sebastian's confident his movie's gonna make millions if he's suddenly proven innocent so the guy tells Sebastian that the Bellevue police have physical evidence tying him to the crime, which is not true. Which is not true. And to make it real, Haslett shows Sebastian a phony memo on Bellevue police letterhead detailing the evidence linking Sebastian to the murders. And I mean, they had it on the me in the media too. They had it. Uh, so it's really elaborate. So it's really setup. believable. Yeah. yeah. So the mob mobsters offer to destroy the so-called evidence, but they need Sebastian to tell them exactly what happened in the Rafe house the night of the murder. Oh, man. And, you know, he's been denying and denying it. And finally, on July 18th, 1995, one year after the murders, Sebastian meets Haslett at the Ocean Point Resort, and the cameras are rolling. And he walks into the room, and he takes off his shoes, stretches out on the love seat, and at that point he lets his guard down. And he starts to confess. And um, later he would say that, the guy because the guy's really pressuring him and really pressuring him and, and not threatening him but they know that they're dangerous supposedly dangerous mobsters right. and so you think it would be poly said, walnuts and all that, that he, he said that he he told them what he thought they wanted to hear but the police are like no this is but your confession but he confessed but he said he made it up because he thought that's right. what they wanted to hear. So then the next day he brings a teeth to the crime boss to tell his story which was recorded in, on an undercover tape Sebastian, Atif, and Miyoshi were arrested, but the case is just beginning. Sebastian says he was lying. Undercover officers had intimidated him into making the confession. Huh. But no sooner were they arrested than the same Canadian government that set up the trap to catch them led an international battle to spare their lives. Washington wants them to be extradited, but if they go to Washington, uh, they'll face the death penalty. And mm -hmm. Canada has abolished it and doesn't want to extradite them because of that. Gotcha. So um, finally, the prosecutor in Seattle agrees that they won't seek the death penalty. So they um, now 25 years old. They're finally extradited to face the murder after six years of legal wrangling. So it took six years 
of all this legal wrangling across the border, mm-hmm. they finally get extradited to face the murder charges. So they get this team of attorneys that believe they're innocent. Teresa Olson, who's a um, public defender, but then guards at the King County Jail report seeing her having sex with Sebastian during an attorney-client meeting. So then oh, no. she gets kicked off the case. She's banging one of the dudes? Mm-hmm. Is, he, yep. is he that desirable, do you think? Well, he, I don't know. Like, no, not really. They just can't control themselves? But um, so his new attorneys were this Ivy League dream team. They were among wait, Seattle's wait. best and most say, expensive criminal defense when lawyers. When you say Ivy League dream team, do you mean Greg the Hammer Valentine and no, Bruce the Barber? No, that's not what I'm think- thinking They were the dream team. So by September 2003, Sebastian and Atif had been in jail for more than eight years, charged but never convicted for the Rafay family murders. Really? Um, never convicted? It would be up to the Supreme Court Judge Charles Myrtle to decide if Sebastian and Atif's oh, chilling confessions would be through. allowed to damn them in an American court because it's illegal with that Mr. Big thing is all illegal in America. The whole thing they Setting did to them up because set it's entrapment. Yeah, it's entrapment. And but it's illegal I here. I like it. I like it. I don't know about but, you, but I like it. I want to move to Canada. But um, the Free healthcare, y'all. The superior court judge ruled that it would be admiss- admitted into evidence. So it was a controversial ruling, and it, so it allowed their own words to be used against them. Um, but while the confessions may be shocking, the defense says they're not true. So finally, in November 2003, more than nine years after the Rafay murders, they get their day in court. They ask the detective to retrace the boys' drive home from downtown Seattle, where they were seen that night. The drive timed out to 18 minutes, at eight, and 18 minutes would lead three minutes for them to be in the house before calling 911. And the prosecutor said that's not enough time in the house to find the bodies and do all the things that Sebastian and Atif told police they did. Yeah. Pull the fa- family car into the garage, enter the home through the garage, so, so discover they and comprehend that. Before it, they went to the movie. They, so they did all the alibi stuff later to like I, make it clear. No, well, they think they snuck out from the movie. Right. Came back and killed him, and then went back, back to the to theater. The movie that gives you two hours, yeah. That that's a little bit, I don't know. So um, smart is what it is. It's smart. So I'm taking note of that for next time I want to murder somebody. So they, um, but it wasn't just the murders. In that three minutes, they also needed time to figure out there'd been a burglary and that a VCR and a disc man were missing. But the defense's claim of the boys' innocence is bolstered by testimony from neighbors on both sides of the Rafay house who heard sounds coming from inside the Rafay house at a time when the boys had an airtight alibi at the movies. The prosecution argued even though the boys were going to see the 950 movie, there's no proof they stayed. The defense argued that even though it could have happened that way, there was no proof it did. Prosecutors were grasping at straws to get a conviction. You know what you do? You interview the kids about the movie The Lion King. Like, how did it end? Yeah, really. Uh, what are the characters' names? Brah. Um, so this, they did have a surprise witness that was a, a friend from the boys' high school days who had once deba- dated Sebastian. She claimed she had a late-night conversation with both of them years ago where they, where they talked about um, murder. They planted a seed for murder or something. He wanted to. He said he wanted to kill somebody someday. Oh boy! I mean, you gotta be pretty low down to murder your own parents, man. Yeah, the judge didn't let that let the jury hear that testimony. So it had been years since Miyoshi had seen his high school buddies. He had moved to Japan and was living under another name when prosecutors forced him to return to Seattle and face his friends at their oh, murder trial. Man, he was once also a target of the RCMP who believed he had helped his friends plan the murder. They had wanted him to give a full confession on tape, but he had refused to implicate his friends in the murder if, for the Mr. Big thing. Huh. But back then, he said his friends were innocent, but he got increasing pressure. He eventually agreed to cooperate, and he was granted immunity from charges of conspiracy to commit murder. So then Yoshi began to reveal more to the police about what he knew, but you didn't know if what he was going to do. So then he tells the court that during a drive from Seattle to Vancouver, a T first first mentioned the idea of killing his family. He recounted a discussion about how the boys would commit the crime and they said they'd use a baseball bat. The prosecution said Miyoshi consulted on an especially chilling part of the plan. Sebastian and Atif visited the Rafay family five days before the murder and that was no coincidence. It was part of the plan. So um, they had found Sebastian's DNA in the shower but he had been staying there for five days, so it, it would have been in it there anyway. Been there anyway. And fingerprints and all of that stuff would have been there. Would have been that. everywhere, so he can't prove that um, he washed all the blood off him. But Miyoshi finally did say a thief watched while Sebastian bludgeoned his family. 
But Sebastian denies ever discussing a plan to murder the family with Miyoshi. And he says Miyoshi didn't have a choice but to testify against his friends because they were going to give him life in prison. So the experts analyzed the patterns on the blood on the wall and found drops everywhere except in one area where there was no blood, indicating that another killer may have stood there during the attack. And they also said a pillow was moved during the bludgeoning. Then they thought there was a third killer who was um, in the house, too, because of the blood spatter evidence. So there was some evidence there was three people in, that were involved. Now, well, Mayoshi could have been a third. I think but Joe eventually they were, they, were, um, pro- they were prosecuted. They were convicted of the murders. Of, they were? Yes, they, they were ended convicted. up getting convicted. They go to jail? Yes, they're in jail. They're in jail right now? Yep. Um, they went back to court in 2004 to hear their sentence. They both got um, life three life sentences to run consecutively. Huh. Um, and there is a, there's a Netflix show called The Confession Tapes that I was saying that was supposed to be good, and one of them yeah. is about this case. The Confession Tapes. Yep. And so that is... So, so check one of out the alternate, on Netflix. One Netflix, of, if you'd like to support us, $10 yep. million dollars a second. One of the alternate theories is that um, the dad was a Sunni... Muslim, yeah, and was very outspoken against the, the Shia Shiites. community. And um, there was a couple. There was a couple other murders that had happened that were very similar um, months before that were religiously motivated. And so there was talk that maybe it was something like that. Would that be terrible if they were in jail and they didn't? All they did was see a movie and yeah, and they're just guilty of being idiots. Yeah, I assholes. mean the only thing, the only thing I thought that would make me think that possibly they're innocent is that I would think if they're in that mob life, I would yeah. think they would admit it sooner. Yeah. It took uh, a long time for them to admit because it. I think they'd be like trying to earn these mafia guys. Trust me. Yeah. We murdered. I would think they would do that sooner. Yeah. But still, if you're going to leave your sister with autism, just to, I mean, unless you're just an asshole and you don't care about her. Yeah. Then I guess you deserve to be in prison. Well, hey, I don't know. I, yeah. Nobody deserves that. But unless, you know, unless a running back who scored 100 touchdowns wants to put you in prison, okay. that's okay. All right, we better wind this up, babe. Yeah, uh, it's pretty boring. No, one thing I want to add is uh, July 12th of 94, because that was July 13th. Yes. At 2 in the morning, so that day while they were at the movie, um, Tommy Dreamer uh, teamed up with Terry and Dory Funk Jr. to take on the public enemy and Hack Myers, uh, and, and then the Tasmaniac also fought Jimmy Superfly Snooka in ECW. I'm glad that, we know that. That was really big. That was extreme championship wrestling, so I want you to know that. Okay, well, that's important. Well, it is important for you important to know. Important to my life. For, well, it's for you to realize Jimmy Superfly Snooka is really the key that brings us all together. All right. So anyway, they were convicted, and I think uh, maybe you and I should go visit them in prison and talk to them. I don't think we're going to do that. Okay, so all check right. out the, the show on Netflix. What's it called? The Confession Tapes. The Confession Tapes on Netflix, and thank you for joining us mm-hmm. for episode 5, 1994 of American Timelines. Get out of here, Chuck Berry. Get the hell out of here, Chuck Berry. Thank you. Everybody's Got One by Matt Truman Ego Trip, available at Amazon.com.